thank John and Anna for the opportunity to talk and the society. So um, I have nothing to disclose. So I'm not gonna go into as much detail about diagnosing. Um, that was a great overview and I will say that most of the patients that I see as a surgeon have already been through most or all of the medical options for gastroparesis by the time they make it to me. Um, so the more that are in development, the better. Um, so, but these are the three main patient populations I see with gastroparesis. Um, diabetic, type one and type two, um, idiopathic, the long list of things including autonomic dysfunction, and then importantly, iatrogenic. A lot of people who have had uh, one or more foregut surgeries and have associated delayed gastric emptying, we never know which came first, but um, we see that not uncommonly. So the gastric emptying syncography, a four-hour test demonstrating 10% or more of retained contents, and the four-hour time is the gold standard, as was said um, before. And then the smart pill, you've heard a lot about it already, um, also useful for, as a diagnostic test for gastroparesis. And I'll also consider someone to have gastroparesis if I see this on endoscopy in a patient who's been MPO, um, which is not uncommon for my patients and we do modify their diet ahead of surgery to try to reduce that um, being seen day of. This is the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index. This is something I use on my patients in clinic both pre and post op just to track how they're doing. Um, it's a scale with nine uh, subtopics here, nausea, vomiting, fullness, early satiety, and bloating distension. Each one scored on a zero to five, so the composite's anywhere from zero to 45. And normal subjects are gonna have a score less than 17. So if I'm talking to anyone um, who's a foregut patient, they get this questionnaire, I glance at it, I kind of say to myself, you know, they're kind of hovering in the two range on their scores, ought we to test their emptying? The answer to me is usually yes. So brings me right into this study. Is there an association between failed anti-reflux surgeries and delayed emptying? And this study found um, in a small number of failed patients, 16, compared to a control group, there was less, um, of less emptied per minute. Um, that's the way this study looked at it, it was percentage emptied per minute, um, more solid remaining, and then the half time of liquid also was higher. Um, Nissen fundoplication has been shown to improve motility on its own. So for a patient who's coming in with GERD and mild emptying, you can consider maybe avoiding uh, a pyloroplasty. Um, and what they found was fundoplication alone, uh, almost, you know, not quite halved the emptying time. Um, adding a pyloroplasty, though, also decreased that even more profoundly. So contraindications to... Uh, laparoscopic pyloroplasty. Patients with severe obesity probably don't need a pyloroplasty. They need a different operation, which you'll hear more about. Um, patients who are on medications such as opioids, which tend to uh, prolong their emptying, I try to get them off that whenever possible. It's not always possible. Um, folks with diabetes who also have poor blood sugar control, part of that's because their emptying is worse if their control is worse. So if I can get them improved at all before surgery, um, it's good for them. They could even become symptom-free or reduced um, with medical therapy alone. Um, and I don't operate on anyone with an A1C less than eight from uh, primarily pyloroplasty. I will put a feeding tube in them and try to get their sugars improved. Um, and then folks that have that sort of global GI tract dyspepsia or dysfunction, it's not that you can't operate on them, it's just that you're not going to improve them as much as they hope. Um, the heineke Michelitz pyloroplasty is the most straightforward, and that, so that's the one I tend to do most often. Um, it's a longitudinal incision uh, along the pylorus, extending from the antrum onto the duodenum a ways, and then a transverse closure of that. Um, so here you can see this is, um, has already been made. I will say that I do uh, a uh, minimal coker maneuver first just to get some duodenal mobilization, just to take some tension off of that closure. I start in the middle. Um, I find that's helpful to avoid backwalling um, the duodenum in the stomach in that area, and that's just the um, most common technical issue. And then run, uh, I use a barbed absorbable suture, run that up uh, cephalad, and then I do a second uh, barbed suture that I run down, and I do it in that way, like I said, just to avoid narrowing. Um, tend to take bigger bites as I come up to avoid a dog ear being formed on the inside of uh, the closure. And this is what it looks like um, after pyloroplasty. I do leak test with methylene blue um, or with air. 
Circular stapled is another good way to do a pyloroplasty. Um, in this, you take a circular staple, stapler, um, you make a couple of purse string sutures to grab the pylorus to invaginate it on to the circular stapler fire, and then you've got um, part of the pylorus um, excluded in a nice handy pyloroplasty. It's a bit higher cost um, just because of the stapler, but still a viable option. Um, the Jabulet and Finney pyloroplasties are probably uh, overkill for this patient population. Um, Jabulet is going to spare the um, pylorus itself, so it's for a more commonly used in a procedure of pyloric scarring. And by definition, these patients are not going to have pyloric scarring. They're going to have, have normal um, appearing pylorus. But the end result of that, as well as the Finney, which is going to extend through, um, looks the same. Technically, I think they're a bit more demanding um, just because you have suturing of the posterior as well as the anterior, so probably a bit more time intensive and a little bit of overkill in this um, patient population. So um, this is a, one of the first studies looking exclusively at pyloroplasty um, for gastroparesis. It's a smaller study, 28 patients. It definitely shows an improvement in uh, emptying half time after pyloroplasty. And then prokinetic use decreases markedly, and I think after listening to the talk, the last talk about the side effects of um, those motility agents, it's great to get patients off of them whenever you can. So uh, overall, 71% of these folks had normalized emptying and the length of stay was 3.7 days. Interestingly, when you look at the symptom profile here, you do have improvement across all scores, um, or all symptoms rather, but the greatest effect is in uh, vomiting and bloating, I would say, in this study. This is another study looking at uh, pyloroplasty plus fundoplication. It's an older study, but still interesting, and it um, focuses in on 30 patients who had bloating uh, but normal emptying, and those patients received a fundoplication only. Uh, their symptom scores are here, so bloating pre and then post did improve somewhat. Interestingly, 35 patients who had bloating as well as delayed emptying um, got a Nissen plus a pyloroplasty. Um, those people, have reason to get improvement with a pyloroplasty, and they clearly do in bloating. So bloating, patients with bloating are definitely a subgroup that I'm going to think hard about pyloroplasty, especially if they have delayed emptying. Um, this is a larger series looking at pyloroplasty um, alone, as, as well as pyloroplasty plus anti-reflux surgery. And um, in this study, 86% of people normalized emptying after pyloroplasty. So I think at the end of the day, it will normalize emptying, whether or not that um, improves symptoms. It just depends on what the patient's symptoms are. In this case, there was improvement across all symptom scores, both at one month and six month. I think, um, you know, the more sustained symptom improvement is seen here with nausea and then with, or I'm sorry, not with nausea, with emesis rather, and then um, with bloating, so. And then that kind of got me interested in whether doing a pyloroplasty plus um, another operation to improve nausea might be reasonable. And this is a small study that looks at just that. It combines pyloroplasty with uh, gastric electric stimulation, which you'll hear more about later. Um, this is a study of 27 patients who got a Heineke Mikulitz pyloroplasty and a gastric um, nerve stimulator placed. There's a 6% infection rate in this um, patient group, which is notable. Um, the author does make note that there was some perhaps patient-related um, patient sabotage, um, but the 6% is interesting. I can say in my own personal experience, I have a 0% infection rate when you put these two together, which I know is the thing that worries people most about combining these, a clean contaminated and a clean, in a clean case, never had an issue. Um, and here you can see that uh, vomiting and bloating again improve significantly with a 3 to 0.5 uh, in terms of their GCSI subscore. Um, interestingly here now you've got a, improvement in nausea and early satiety, and these are out to 12 months, so clearly having significant improvement across um, a lot of these symptom markers. And then looking at a pyloroplasty on endoscopy, this is three months post, and this is why it works. You take a patient who's got either a spastic pylorus or a normal pylorus, and you're just going to take them to something that's gonna empty better, and that's the way I describe it to my patients, so.
So pyloroplasty does normalize emptying. Um, it may improve patient symptoms, particularly if those patient symptoms in include bloating and vomiting. Um, it has some improvement for other symptoms as well. I think after you see, if you're seeing a patient for failed foregut surgery, you need to think about whether emptying played into their failure. Um, at our institution, we routinely get emptying studies on those patients before we would take them back to surgery um, and add an opening procedure such as a pyloroplasty um, if their emptying is delayed. And then I think pyloroplasty for gastroparesis patients is just a tool. These patients are um, not curable, but certainly we can palliate their symptoms, and I think pyloroplasty in the right setting um, can be a good tool um, to improve patient life and gastroparesis. That's all I've got.